Hey everyone, welcome back to another interview. My name is Stephen Fick and today I have the opportunity to talk with David Baker of Baker's Blade and Forged in Fire. What a lot of you don't know is that he's and done- the Holly, and, and the Hollywood Combat Center and- uh, <laughs> I and read my whole resume. <laughs> no. <laughs> so David has been creating weapons for quite a while now uh, and been in lots of different kinds of productions. And I wanted to start off with this question for you, David, is when did you uh, start making weapons? Um, right about the time you and I met, which was about 35 years ago. <laughs> so we have- No, we have, 30 years ago. We have known each other for quite Just a while. Was it, I, it, it, it was the late 80s? All right. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that's when, when we when we Yeah, and we fought our infam, infamous duel. <laughs> <laughs> Which we can tell the story of later. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I started then. I started then. I was performing on stage at the Renaissance Fairs, and... Uh, and I was teaching classes in, in uh, theatrical combat. And um, honestly, there, there, there weren't a lot of places to, um, to buy things. There, there weren't a lot of resources. There was like the museum replicas catalog. Um, and honestly, they, those wouldn't hold up the theatrical combat in any way, shape or form. Um, and, uh, you know, there was like the Marto stuff, the, the you know, the, the Toledo steel stuff. And that, of course, wouldn't hold up. So um, there was a, a, it was a matter of I couldn't afford to buy it, so I just started making it. Right, because the only thing we had available back then was, besides what you mentioned, Del 10 coming out of Italy. Well, yeah, but Del 10, they didn't start hitting until like the early 90s. I don't remember having any of the Del, access to any of the Dell 10s until like 92 or something. Oh, okay. It was that much later. So when you were making... I think, I could, I could be wrong. Right. But I mean, again, th th those were, those were in a, a way out of my budget at the time. Yeah. For there was no way I could afford them. Um, yeah. And then uh, since I was working in the entertainment industry on and off, I was introduced to aluminum weapons, um, which uh, which I then started producing, and and that that really led me to the career in in building um, weapons. Um, I think it was, oh man, we're we're going way back now. Um, what were the two early West Coast meets? It was Benicia. Oh yeah, and Livermore. And was Livermore, yes. Yeah. Um, right. And, and um, I kind of introduced aluminum weapons to the uh, as trainers to, to the, the HEMA people, which early HEMA, which was Arma, HEMA. I mean, it, I don't know what the heck. We, it didn't really have a name back then much. But um, uh, so, you know, that kind of launched the career. Okay. Fantastic. And so, when you started making the aluminum weapons, you started making them for stage uh, combat. Yeah. And as yeah. you were making those, how do you find that working with aluminum is different than creating the steel weapon? Other than forging, of course. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, it's basic stock removal. Um, you know, aluminum, aluminum moves a lot quicker than steel does. But you're still just doing stock removal. The the you know if you took a bar of steel and ground it into the shape of a sword, you'd be doing the exact same thing. If you took a bar of aluminum, the aluminum is a special aluminum. It's seventy seventy five T six aluminum, and what that is is a tempered aluminum. So it's it's like a spring steel, um, but it's a, a, about one third the weight by by volume. So you, you know I was able to make swords that were um, light but still had a, a very um, wide edge profile 
so they're a lot safer to use when you know in, in a theatrical situation and then of course like i said they they, they just worked out well for trainers um you know because you could bash them together they were the right shape uh, you know wooden wooden trainers are certainly viable trainers but they're just not the right shape and they the handles tend to be too big and the blades tend to be too chunky and um, and I've got a nice scar from taking a splinter up the arm from one of them. So I just found that the aluminums were uh, trainers that I could make in any shape I wanted. Whether it was rapiers, uh, small swords, uh, broad swords, axes, whatever. What has been, uh, what are your, so I, I asked around a little bit and some people had some questions. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> so I didn't do it. <laughs> here's one of my favorite questions that somebody wanted to ask. Okay. What weapon that you've created has brought you the most joy in creation? That you really just enjoyed making? Um, I, I can't, I can't really dial it down to a single weapon but I would say as far as weapon styles go um, it, it's uh, it's really been rapiers and small swords I find them as um, as weapons and as works of art uh, truly amazing um, uh, the art is not is not it's an elegant weapon both of them the, there's a style to them um, they're they're not only uh, a martial tool, but they, they are, um, they're high art and high fashion for the time. Uh, so when something comes together like that, you're, you're, you're getting things that are, you're trying to hit balance and weight points that are, are you know, people don't believe that I, I make small swords that weigh less than a pound, but I do, you know, yeah. hand forged blades, ground, to needles that will go right through you that, that weigh less than a pound and rapiers that you know are only maybe two pounds um, and still extremely effective weapons so I think that's those are the ones that really excite me because you really have to work hard to dial them in I mean you stand at that grinder fighting for an ounce you know or, or trying to move that balance point a half an inch yeah. it's uh it, it's one speaking of your artwork I wanted to bring this up for the people that are getting oh, the yeah. and I haven't seen this burger in a long time. Yeah, this is one that you made for me. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about the creation of this Stiavona is that I asked for specific balance points and weight, and you were able to create it through your experience. Yeah, that was what that was like eight years ago, man. Yeah, yeah. I, and I fight with it every, every week. Uh, Excellent. That's that's the part. That's the part I love is when um, I, I hate seeing things put up on a shelf. I mean, you can't really fight with sharps. But when I make a weapon, I, I really love the fact that it's out there being used. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. whether it's a, 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 a bushcraft knife or or uh, or something like you know something like a sword like you got, and you use it, and you know you take it out and really. Put it through its paces. I one of the things that I wanted to bring up. I don't know that a lot of people know this, but you were involved with Deadliest Warrior as well. Yeah. Can you tell us? Yeah. What you, I, um, what was that? Can you tell us what you did? Your involvement with Deadliest Warrior. Okay. Well. <laughs> Deadliest, on, on the show Deadliest Warrior, um, I had worked with the producers of that show on, on several productions. Uh, um, other things that I had done weapons for, we did a, um, an Alexander the Great uh, with them. We did, uh, oh gosh, I don't know. I, there, anyway, there were several productions I did with that production company. Um, they had started the show and um, they, they started renting equipment and then testing the equipment that they rented. And so by the time they had gotten through about half the shows they were filming in the first season, they had blown the prop budget. Uh, they had broken weapons and, and rental houses charge 
quite a bit when you return uh, broken weapons. Um, so uh, they gave me a call. They said, hey, can you come in and build? And I said, yeah. So I ran down. And, and since the show had basically two components, there was the in-house component, which was the, the testing of the weapons and the guys, all the, the smack talk and everything else. And then there was the recreation part where they, we had the recreation battles or whatever. So I made the aluminum weapons for the recreation battles, and then I made the, the steel weapons for the um, actual show. Um, it was a great experience. Um, it really brought me to the point where I was making all these exotic weapons. I mean, uh, we had six, six weapons a show. Yeah, six, six to eight weapons per show. And uh, I don't remember, you know, three, three seasons of that. And, um, you know, I, it just gave me the opportunity to make weapons that I would never go out and make. I would never just run out and make a hunga monga. I would never run out and, and make a Zonde spear. Um, they're just outside of, of the weapons that truly interest me. But being assigned to do that in, in a work situation, it was like, well, okay, great. So I learned a lot, learned a ton. And then um, as the show developed, uh, I started doing a couple of segments that were on, on air in, in like showing people how I was building these weapons. But I also worked with the stunt crew on the show and um, I actually wound up doubling some of the uh, experts. So you see a knee ride by on a horse and you'll see the cut being done. And it wasn't necessarily the expert. Sometimes that was, that was my leg in their boot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing that uh, I wanted to bring up. You not, only, you not only make weapons, but you also fence and ride and use them. Oh, on yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I came to it, I came to building through studying the weapon. And, and, um, uh, I, it's one of those things. It's I would find it hard to build these weapons if I didn't use them. Um, understanding a balance point in in a in a longsword or in a rapier when you don't haven't used it when you've got no technique, um, you can go by the books. You know, you can go and you know, so and so says the balance point should be here, and great, do that. But why is the balance point there? Until you understand that, then you you can start adjusting those things so so for me the adventure with these weapons has always been um to learn as much to use as much to train as much as i can i mean i'm in the situation now where i don't have a real place to to train with other people but i've got the heavy bag and a bunch of training weapons and i beat the snot out of that bag on a regular basis and you know working with um in the entertainment industry i've had the opportunity to do things on horseback certainly for Deadliest Warrior and a couple of other uh, productions that I was involved in, um, where we, you know, we uh, friend, a, you know, a mutual friend of ours, Anthony Delonges, worked with him training up his horses to use for archery and lances and swords, and so then took that knowledge of being on foot with these weapons and then put them up on a horse. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it it definitely changes your perspective on historic stories and historic um you know, you, you'll, you'll read something and they'll they you know or you'll read something written by a quote-unquote expert and you go well i know that doesn't work why because i've tried it <laughs> yeah, i've been there and I mean, uh, uh, right. yeah I, I get it i get it that's what they said and yeah, that's what they said in the sagas but um yeah no <laughs> Have, so I, I think practical practical history is is a uh, is a wonderful thing. Um, you know, you you get immediate feedback on whether something works or it doesn't. I mean, just try building a catapult someday. Yeah, I think one of my favorite terms <laughs> for this kind of thing is experimental archaeology. Yes, yes, um, that's yeah, it's a perfect term. Um, you know, you. Again, you, you read descriptions or you look at a tapestry and it's got these weapons in the background and you say, well, 
that looks like it would weigh way too much to use or um, how could that possibly work? The physics of that thing isn't right. But those were made by artists in the period. So they were looking at something. Yeah. So then we try to recreate that something and, and make it work. And, and uh, it's like getting an onager to throw a rock is not that easy. I mean, it usually just wants to throw it 30 feet in the dirt right in front of itself. So you got to get all these factors dialed in to get that rock to come up and out of that chute, you know, so it'll go, you know, 100 yards and, you know, 60 feet in the air. With force. The, the oh, yeah. Amount, you know, the you amount throw of a 15-pound rock. <laughs> yeah, the amount of physics they understood. Uh, it's like the Majowski cleavers. Fantastic. Well, again, that's... Fantastic weapon. Yeah, but it's a weapon that we, you know, it's a weapon that we don't have a physical, I mean, there's not one. Right. I mean, you know, we see him, we see him in the tapestries and in the, in the uh, illuminated Bibles, um, but there's no physical real weapon surviving that, that is that thing. So are we looking at an artist's interpretation? Right. So, I mean, we know it works because I, I know people who have built them and I've built one myself and yeah, it'll cleave the snot out of stuff. But, but again, are we looking at an art, artist's interpretation to do German longsword? Do you actually need two thumbs on the right hand or two right hands or whatever it is? <laughs> well, uh, for those watching this video, I'm going to put a link to the Majowski Bible in the description. So you can find out what we're talking Perfect. about. Yeah. Uh, Going back to forged in fire, are there any? Oh weapons, yes. Are there any weapons that you that the production company has wanted to feature on the show, but thought were too difficult in the time frame? Have you run into? Um, them? Too difficult? No. Some of them were too stupid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, please no. Um, what's one example? No, come on. I mean, look, I'm not going to make a battle if it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, how would we test it anyway? I mean, how do you know what's a good battle if? I mean, you know, it's like it kills Klingons. Uh, all right. Let's see. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, there there are weapons that there are weapons that are terribly difficult to um to test in that uh they were like like a ball and chain or spike you know a, a flail a spike flail um those were made to be used while you were wearing armor uh just to protect yourself from your own weapon um it's it's really easy to rip yourself to shreds with one of those i've made one years ago and um yeah i mean i i could get it to stick in a shield i could get it to puncture old helmets i could get it to do all kinds of things but i could also uh put a couple of holes in my own leg when it bounced back off something and and with the show um with forged we don't get to practice with with a smith's weapon Okay, you know all the all the weapons that you know they pull the towel away and and the weapon is is there. Those display weapons are the weapons that I built, um, and we use those to then test the tests and or practice the tests. So let me, but, let me get this straight: you run the weapons that you made through the same yes. test that the Smiths are going to do. Usually, yes. Yeah, because we have, I mean, that's the only way, that's the only way we have to test any of these things. What is going on at the end of my driveway? Huh, nothing. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, if, if you've never swung a claymore before or a basket hilt or a Napoleonic saber, you, you can't go and test one. <laughs> right. 
So, you know, Doug, you know, when Doug does his kill test, he needs something that's sharp, ready to go, um, that will do the work. So basically mine go through those tests. Um, part of my job is helping to develop the, some of the tests. So we, yeah, we beat the crud out of my, pardon me. We do beat the crud out of my weapons. And then they which is great. They're shown. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, yes, they, I mean, you know, the timeline kind of changes a lot because you know, we might do the reveal and then do the tests or, or, or things like that. So, um, but yeah, we've, you know, that we've broken a few, um, you know, out of the, I don't know, I think we've done 180 shows so far, something like that. So I've done 180 weapons, yeah. um, you know, yeah. full size weapons over the, plus, plus a few replacements, plus example weapons for the opening of the show and stuff like that. So, and a lot of weapons. more episodes coming. Yes, actually, we've been picked up for another season. Uh, it's in casting right now. Of course, we're in, uh, you know, everybody's in lockdown. So, um, but we're still moving forward. I'm actually started to build the weapons. We, we've been picked up for 50 more shows. Oh. So, uh, season eight. Yay. Um, and since I bought the old Tumbled on Manor here, it's a good thing because I need to fix this place <laughs> without a job. That ain't going to happen. Um it's uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, you know, the, there are changes brewing, so people will be uh, uh, you know, the, the, it's things. Things are going to change. Things, things. Uh, the, the show's evolving, uh, which is exciting. And then, then of course, we've got our, our spinoff show, which is coming up. Which is, um, I'm sorry, I'm, my framing was getting a little weird. Um, our spinoff show, which is uh, uh, Beat the Judges, which people have been screaming for since day one. Um, and basically, in Beat the Judges, the format is champions, former champions from our show, come back. And those champions fight for the chance to then compete against one of us judges, myself, Ben, or Jay. and. Um, and take us on in uh, what is a, a an eight hour straight eight hour challenge. That's we've awesome. got eight hours to complete the weapon. <laughs> wow! So yeah. it was uh, it was a lot of fun to film. Um, I had a great time, and uh, I, I think it's it, it's very exciting. It's going to be a fun show. Sounds sounds like it's fantastic and marathon just trying to continue. Uh, Working yeah, eight hours, eight hours. Is, eight hours is a tough, uh, tough amount of time to complete a, a, a com, you know, a full size weapon. Or I'm, you know, I can't really tell you what's going to be on the show, but uh, I'll, I'll let people uh, wait and see. But um, it was very exciting. It was a lot of fun. Sounds good. Now, uh, you were speaking about lockdown just a little bit ago. Oh yeah. Is the show still doing any work during lockdown? Well, um, I can't give you any details, but yeah, we're we're going to um, we're going to do a bit of a special, a kind of filmed at home special. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I can't I can't get into discussing the the format, but again, you know, our fans have been so great to us. Um, you know, through through you know, as we develop the show, because I mean, we kind of you know started one back away and, and I mean the show's format hasn't really changed but much but um, anyway our fans are great and we love them and uh, so while everybody's kind of stuck in lockdown we'd like to give them a little something extra so nice. that's nice. uh that's what we're gonna start working on that on Monday so well I'm looking forward I get to, to spend the weekend I get to spend the weekend cleaning the shop because it's a mess <laughs> I know. Oh, Who am I kidding? <laughs> You've seen my shop before. <laughs> yeah. It's it's something you actually work in. Yeah, and people are always amazed that I can't actually work in it. <laughs> if it gets loud here in a minute, it's because the there's a storm brewing. All right. Well, yeah. I, before we go, I would one of the things I'd like to do is. 
I've been able to talk with many of my friends while we're in lockdown. And thanks for spending some time with me and with everyone else watching this, Dave. But yeah, you know, I love you, Steve. It's always a pleasure. Can you tell tell me a story that you remember from our past? <laughs> Your your lovely your lovely wife uh, has has always been um, the den mother for for a uh, a large group of miscreants. Yeah. <laughs> back in the Ren Fair days, back when I was performing at Ren Fairs, and uh, you had a, an encampment, you guys were doing a teaching thing, I think, and and some performance stuff as well, um, which is pretty much where we met. And uh, so one day after I was done performing and everything else, and I think there might have been some, some, uh, somebody's custom meat involved. Like or, yeah, there, there might've been some, some uh, high test um, <laughs> drinking going on. Uh, you and I had decided to just play around with swords. Now this was, this was just us kind of going three quarter speed and playing tag. Um, most people would say playing tags with swords, that's kind of stupid. Um, and I'd have to agree with them. It was kind of stupid, but we did it anyway. And, uh, somewhere along the line, you actually slipped and you had made a dagger. That's a Yes. You had made a dagger and the knuckle bow on that dagger had a sharp pointy end on it. I made that. And when you slip, you... okay. When you slip, that thing poked you in the gut. We kept playing, and you went, ow, I think I've been stabbed. And, and uh, I think, your, well, your wife said, you've been stabbed in the gut. You need to go to the hospital. <laughs> so was it, what, the next morning or that night I, that you went to the ER? You never did. I was laying in the dirt getting ready to pour moonshine into the hole. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that <laughs> happened. Nothing, no, thought nothing of it. Six, seven years later, I'm doing some show somewhere, and somebody asked me, are you the guy who, who stabbed Stephen Fick in the duel? And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, are you the David Baker who fought the duel with Stephen Fick and stabbed him in the guts and sent him to the hospital? And I'm like, yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> and it just took on a life of its own. And for almost 20 years, people bring up the duel between you and I that happened at a Ren Fair at night. And there's all kinds of crazy ass stories about how we got there. And, and you know, well, you know, it was at night and they were fighting with lanterns. And I've heard that it was, it was over some, you said something to my girlfriend at the time or my ex-wife or whatever. I don't remember. It's, it, but <laughs> it just got so huge. <laughs> So yeah, that's our history. The duel. Oh, those were good it's times. It's coming down now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the rain going. Well, Dave, I'm gonna let you go because we're it's starting to affect the internet a little bit. Can you hear me? Well, I think we lost Dave. Uh, there's a storm coming down, uh, and I want to thank you, Dave, for spending some time with me chatting with me. It's always great to catch up with you. I miss you terribly, and it's always a pleasure to see you on TV on Forged in Fire. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at other events, and I know sometimes you're able to join us at Combat Con in Las Vegas. So one of these days, I hope to see you there again. I want to thank all of you for joining me and watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and have a wonderful day, and thanks again to Dave.